wondered what the sequence of events was. Did you first meet Rose Lichtermark and she told you she had a script or you wanted to make a film about someone on the autism spectrum? Yeah, I wanted to make this story and I knew Rose from college and we were at a friend's, mutual friend's going away party and I was telling her about the, the project and she was interested in it and she had just finished a creative nonfiction nonfiction master's degree and I'm not a prolific writer by any stretch of the imagination and I struggle to write a sentence you know I'm just like very slow and careful about every single word and and I knew I needed some help just to kind of flush out the story so um, I worked with Rose for over a year um, back and forth basically I started with a uh, uh, like an outline of, of the story I wanted to tell and and then she put it into prose form and and then there was just a lot of back and forth as it you know developed from there we also worked with with Micah Bloomberg who's um, who's a really great writer he's, he's done a lot of work as a sound man on a lot of great independent New York films and um, but he, he has written plays and he's a really smart guy so he, he helped me further define these characters. And, you know, I, I stuck to the script with most of the professional actors, although there's some improv, improv, improv with, with even like, you know, the more experienced actors. I do want to, you know, keep learning as much as I can about the condition because it's always fascinated me. There was one particular article that um, I had read in the New York Times and then I, I did more research and found a bunch of different articles and and it's this common phenomenon that they call eloping where kids on the spectrum just kind of wander off from home and there's there's a funny attraction to trains. Did you shoot some of this? I shot a little bit but it was mostly was shot by, it was two, two guys, Adam Jandrup and Ethan Palmer. They hadn't worked together before, but they got along so well, and, and I think they would definitely work with each other again. We, neither of them had assistance, nor did we have a gaffer. It was entirely lit with practicals and daylight, and, um, and they were just extremely hard workers. They were, they were incredible, because we were using like sizable cameras. It's a Sony F3 is the name of the camera. It's, it's, it's really got an extraordinary like palette and it's colored, color chip. Yeah, well going into the project, I knew that I wanted to use a kid, work with a kid on the autism right. spectrum. And, and it was tough because we knew we wanted, uh, you know, the family is, is from Latin America. Oh. And, but I had already cast the mom, so I, I it was important to me that, to find a kid that looked like uh -huh. like he could be the son of, of Andrea Suarez, who was playing the mom. And it was, a, it was actually a very small pool of kids in New York um, that were on the spectrum and looked like they could be the son of Andrea. Uh, so we broadened our search to autism blogs and one of my casting directors, Eleanor Hendricks, was heading this up. and got a response from Jesus's mother in Florida and she was very excited about the project and we sent her the script and she sent us a video of him reading a couple of the scenes and it was very good but bringing a kid from Florida just seemed impractical and unaffordable so we kept looking here and then didn't find anyone that I was as confident about so we you know we I ended up going down and, and meeting him and his mom in South Carolina and then brought them up last summer just as like for like a test run and kind of show her what the environment was like and let let them meet some of the people working on the project and so it, it was a good fit and you know definitely worth the extra expense and headache of uh, flight logistics and stuff. And he hadn't been directed before? No he hadn't. Um, Jesus is, is um, very smart and and I think he, he genuinely loves acting so you know like a lot of kids on the spectrum or like kids with ADD it's like when they they have something they're interested in they're they're extraordinary and um, 
and I think he he was really able to focus on on doing what I was asking. Why I was also confident about Jesus acting this part is that he, he has a two hour bus commute to school each way. But I was I was impressed that he, you know, could, was sitting on a bus for four hours a day and it made me feel like he'd he'd have the patience for sitting on the subway for eight hours a day, you know. And and it was the case. He was a real trooper and hardly ever complained and we d we had a very very small budget. We're really only to, able to work with people who like believed in what we were doing. Eleanor Hendricks, is she with Red Buckets or was she? She was she in that film, she, The Pleasures of Being Robbed? Yeah, she was, and Daddy Long Legs. Right. Um, and she's a close friend of Josh. of Josh. Right. And did you see Josh in the movie? Uh, Josh has a great part. He's the he's the obnoxious guy smoking the e-cigarette who gets in the fight with the lady. So he had like knuckle tattoos and right. a do rag and a hat and yeah, he was pretty well disguised. We shot in a very flat mode uh, um, camera setting um, that gives you like extra options, you know, in in post production. But I, I got really used to that quality and, and wanted to you know embrace it because it's kind of a, a drab story and, and a muted story and um, I wanted the palette to reflect that but I did a lot of a lot of color studies leading like you know when we were getting ready to make the movie and as we were designing the set I did one thing that was kind of fun where I made a flip book it was just two different colors one color representing um, Jesus or Ricky's Ricky's purple, and then one that rep represented a, a warmer, like um, orange for the mom, and they're almost like complementary colors. And what I did was I had we did it in watercolor, and, and one card represented a minute, what I imagined would be a minute of the film, and then you could do a flip book through all of them, and, and it would just go back and forth, and just to try to get a sense of what the color rhythm could huh. possibly be. I mean, I, I think it was more of a way to just like deeper seed, like kind of this parallel back and forth than maybe it was the color, but it was, it was beautiful to look at on the wall as well. A lot of parents with children on the spectrum have been giving me, uh, you know, compliments that I, that I really did show some something honest and and that's greatly rewarding for me because I was very nervous going into this that I that I would miss the mark you know because I don't really know I mean who who can really say what it's like to you know be on the spectrum what we talked about is that the parents came here from Mexico um, like cro they crossed the border by themselves and um, made their way to New York and had kids in their late teens. Um, they basically cut off all ties to their family in Mexico and they felt deeply isolated and alone and especially after they had a kid who was, you know, abnormal. Um, it, was a, it was a real struggle and, and they, I think the mom built like an even bigger wall around herself and, um, you know, it's kind of a taboo, it's often taboo, I think, with Latin American families, with, with all families, to have a kid who's like abnormal. You know, uh -huh. you, I think you take on a lot of guilt. Sadly, um, you take on a lot of guilt, like it's your fault. And, they're um, undocumented, right? Yeah, they're undocumented. And, and then, of course, you've got like an older sister who's like constantly having to like change her life for the sake of this, this kid is just a constant pain in her butt and um, so that's sort of the dynamic and the dad is is like forced to take jobs out of town and he's and he's gone for for long stretches of time um, so that was kind of the dynamic that we that we oh, constructed okay. and initially we had written it that you know he was working on this this beautiful apple orchard um, with a group of other migrant workers and 
and we would actually go there several times in the movie and, and be with him. But there were some, you know, ironically, there were some some visa issues with the actor I wanted to play the dad oh. initially. We couldn't get him here. We had to postpone all that stuff. And by the time he got here, the apples were all off the trees, and the other workers had gone gone back to Mexico. So um, it was. It was sad to let that go, but it actually enabled us to write the storm into the ending in a in a in a more e easy way because we hadn't shot any of the stuff with the dad until after the storm. Well, we had just begun the subway section of the movie, which we um, were a day and a half into. We had started on Saturday, and then. We shot a little bit on Sunday, but they were shutting down the trains and we had to go get things together back in Rockaway. So we actually got like the last 7 o'clock p.m. train back to Rockaway. Pretty much everybody packed up their stuff. Everyone from the crew packed up their stuff and took off because, you know, people were warning that the storm was going to be serious. I, I was like not accepting it, even though I had seen you things like... You were in like, denial. I was in denial. And, you know, there's one amazing moment. We were like taking the train back out. I forget if we were leaving in the morning on Sunday or coming back Sunday evening, but there was a huge flock of of gulls or or geese rather. Oh, Canada geese. Canada geese in Jamaica Bay, like right near Broad Channel. I've never seen such a big flock. It was like a big communion or like um, gathering. It was like a meeting, like about, and right. you could tell they were like all about to act and they, they knew <laughs> they something the was signal. up they got the signal and I was like Ew. they didn't need any weather.com right? but aside from that I was like totally in denial and um, I stayed along with my two housemates out there and I, I had them leave me the I had them leave me with a camera so that I could shoot stuff if I wanted to and that's when I got that that one shot of those amazing waves yeah, you um, don't live in the Rockaway. I do live in oh, the Rockaway. Yeah, oh my I've been God. living out there for the last few years. I've had a place or sh shared a house with some friends. Yeah, the storm. Well, that worked really well, I guess. That gave it a sort of dramatic, um, an extra dramatic setting, right? Yeah, I yeah. think um, it was very good for the narrative, and the storm was something that was has for so long been spoken about as this like um, just devastation the devastation has been like more what you hear about than the the positive things of it but there's been so much um, positivity actually to come from the storm like what like mainly in community and in the way that people have have gone to know each other better within communities and helped one another and um, I think I, I've never seen anything, been a part of something like so powerful like that, and um, so it, it's nice. And I, and I was even reading in the New Yorker on the on the way over here about like the situation in Boston and how this guy who's from New York and has never really identified with Boston is now really feels like Boston is is his home, and and, it, and it's true that I think with bad comes good. And it is this it is this cycle, and it's important to talk about that. Did, yeah, the, you didn't lose your house or anything, did you? I mean, we, it's been getting rebuilt for the last few months. It, oh. it was like pretty, pretty much. Were you, did you have totaled. to relocate? Okay? Did you have to? Go yeah, to I've been living house? in Brooklyn for the last few last little oh, while. Wow, you're very sort of philosophical about it. Mm -hmm. You didn't lose any films or tapes or. No, I lost more just like stuff like right. my tools my which my woodworking tools and my motorcycle oh your motorcycle yeah that was sad <laughs> wow that's I a know. big one isn't it it is i had this pristine 1983 honda with like a thousand miles on it i got it over the summer from a mechanic friend of mine in rockaway he gave me like a sweet deal on it and it was like a brand new 1983 honda you know it, it was it was impeccable so it was that was really sad so now you have a more humble bicycle? Yeah, I've, I mean, I've had a bicycle and I've been using that more often. Oh. But I actually just got a new motorcycle. Right. So Did I grew up in, in Providence, Rhode Island. Oh. And my parents are artists. My dad's a sculptor. My mom's a, a Renaissance woman who's run 
a, an Argentine tango dance school for the last 15 years, and um, she actually just moved on from that. But she's also a very uh, talented, like, fine artist. And but my dad is more like he's been in and out of the art world. You know, he's he's had a really hard time engaging in the art world, and he's put his middle finger up at it like a few too many times maybe or like back in the day but I don't know hopefully he's going to reconcile all that because he's, he's, he's a very good artist and he's got a lot to share and he's taught me a lot he actually has a there's a quote by Guy Davenport I don't even know who that is but I know the name because of this quote and my dad showed it to me a long time ago and it says that art is always the replacing of indifference with attention. And I think it applies really deeply to like, to my work and, and what I try to do with filmmaking. And especially with this movie, it's just showing, showing people things that they might otherwise not notice. And, and I think that that's really important.